Bible recounts the wisdom of two men, with Solomon being the first. Solomon, possibly ascending to the throne at a young age of around 20, was brought up in a palace filled with conflict. He witnessed the chaos caused by his elder brothers, Amnon and Absalom, from the front row. At this juncture, Solomon's heart was devoted to the Lord. In a dream, as described in 1 Kings 3 verse 5, God appeared to Solomon and said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. God was essentially offering Solomon a blank check, asking him to fill in his desires. Imagine if the Lord woke you up tonight and offered the same. Your response would be a significant reflection of your character. Despite the myriad of things Solomon could have asked for, he chose to request wisdom to be the king he needed to be. This request delighted God, and as a result, Solomon became the wisest man in history and one of the wealthiest. In 1 Kings 3 verses 7 to 15, Solomon says, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? God was pleased with Solomon's request and responded, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Upon waking, Solomon realized it had all been a dream. Solomon proved to be a great king and an exceptional administrator. He built the magnificent temple that his father had dreamed of, which is perhaps Solomon's most renowned achievement. The temple, a magnificent structure, was built by Solomon using materials and plans handed down by his father, David. God had made a promise to David that his son would construct the first permanent place of centralized worship, a prophecy that was centuries old, as mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. The construction of the temple took seven years, while Solomon's palace took 12 years to complete. Interestingly, the temple, made of cut stone, was built in silence, with no sound of hammer or chisel heard. This fact, as stated in 1 Kings 6 verse 7, remained a mystery for many years until the discovery of a massive cave. The size of a large theater, on Mount Moriah near Calvary, outside Jerusalem, the cave floor was covered with millions of small chips from the cut rock. The rock was soft enough to be cut with a pen knife, but it hardened upon exposure to air. All the stones used in the temple were sourced from this cave, where they were cut to fit the above-ground temple. Solomon's reign brought immense prosperity to the Israelites, with their empire extending from Egypt to the Euphrates. Encompassing most of the promised territory, the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon and was awestruck by the splendor. The layout of the temple, as described in the sixth chapter of the Book of Kings, is intricate and technical, making it challenging to visualize. The temple measured 90 feet in length, 30 feet in width, and 45 feet in height. According to Professor Ignaz Alfred Grot of Breslau, the construction cost of Solomon's temple was no less than $30 million. The temple, primarily built with Egyptian materials, was completed no earlier than 1000 BC. Solomon constructed the temple meticulously, sparing no expense and paying attention to every detail. Even the parts not visible to the naked eye were finished to a high standard of quality and accuracy. As a result of his accomplishments, Solomon's reputation spread far and wide, and his power grew substantially. Solomon's building program significantly contributed to his fame. His wisdom was unparalleled, surpassing even the renowned wisdom of the Eastern Egypt. The author of Kings unequivocally stated that there was no comparison, Solomon was the wisest of all. His reputation was well established, and the surrounding nations came to respect the king of Israel. Kings from around the world sent emissaries to hear Solomon's wisdom, and God's kingdom was a blessing to the kingdoms of the world. As stated in 1 Kings for verses 29 to 34, God granted Solomon wisdom, great discernment, and a mind as expansive as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom exceeded that of all the people of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite, Heman, Kalkol, and Dada, the sons of Mahol. His fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs and composed 1,005 songs. He spoke about trees, from the cedar in Lebanon to the hyssop growing on the wall. 
He also spoke about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. People from all nations came to hear Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. While it was common for kings to send emissaries to Solomon, the Queen of Sheba visited Solomon herself to verify the stories she had heard. Her visit exemplifies the widespread fame of Solomon. The Queen of Sheba was drawn to Solomon due to his fame associated with the name of the Lord, likely referring to the wisdom God had granted him. She came to test Solomon with riddles to see if his abilities matched his reputation. As described in 1 Kings 10 verse 1, when the Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon's fame and his relationship with the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. The Queen of Sheba was not a commoner herself, arriving in Jerusalem with a large caravan carrying spices, a significant amount of gold, and precious stones, as mentioned in 1 Kings 10 verse 2. She engaged in conversation with Solomon about all that was on her mind. However, Solomon's wisdom and wealth were beyond her understanding, leaving her breathless after hearing his explanations. Solomon, in his wisdom, answered all the questions posed by the Queen of Sheba. The wisdom of Solomon, his palace, the food on his table, the seating of his officials, the attending servants in their robes, his cupbearers, and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord left the Queen of Sheba in awe. She admitted that she had not believed the reports about Solomon until she saw it for herself. She thanked the Lord for placing Solomon on the throne for the sake of Israel. As a token of her respect, the Queen of Sheba gifted Solomon 120 talents of gold, large quantities of spices, and precious stones. The quantity of spices she gave to King Solomon was unmatched. Hiram's ships brought gold from Offa, along with great cargoes of almond wood and precious stones. Solomon used the almond wood to make supports for the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and to make harps and lyres for the musicians. Such a quantity of almond wood has never been imported or seen since that day. King Solomon gave the Queen of Sheba all she desired and asked for, in addition to what he had given her out of his royal bounty. After her visit, she returned to her own country with her retinue. The Queen of Sheba's visit provides an interesting insight into her character. She did not take people at face value, whether based on their self-reports or the reputation they had garnered from others. She wanted to see the results for herself. The second wisest man in the Bible is Jesus. Much has been said about Jesus, his compassion, grace, humility, but his wisdom is also of great significance. In Luke 11 verse 31, it is stated, And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. At first glance, it may seem that only a very arrogant person would make such a statement about themselves. Considering Solomon was regarded as the epitome of greatness and knowledge, an ordinary man would never think of it, a prudent man would never say it. If we regard the Lord Jesus Christ as a mere man, it would seem unthinkable for him to make such a claim. However, Jesus is not a mere man, but the Son of God, and his wisdom surpasses even that of Solomon. An ordinary man would never have made such a claim about himself, for no man was ever more modest. However, it was the divinity within Jesus that compelled him to speak out. For God to declare his superiority over all his creations is not boasting. One must note the self-awareness of Jesus Christ. He was fully aware of his identity and his greatness. His humility did not stem from ignorance of his own greatness. He was meek and humble in heart, yet he knew he was the King of Kings. He washed his disciples' feet, knowing he was their Master and Lord. He associated with tax collectors and sinners and lived among ordinary people. But he knew he was the only begotten Son of the Father. Solomon was the Son of David, and one of Jesus' significant messianic titles is the Son of David. However, Jesus was a far greater son of David than Solomon ever was. The audacity of Jesus' self-claim is striking. To stand before religious leaders and assert his superiority over Israel's wealthiest and wisest king was bold. Yet Jesus' audacity was well justified. Jesus' wisdom is evident when the authorities were plotting against him. The authorities were determined to eliminate him, but they couldn't simply kill him. The Pharisees, after flattering Jesus, posed a challenging question to him. This is described in Matthew 22 verses 15 to 21 in the Amplified Bible. The Pharisees and Herodians conspired to trap Jesus by distorting his words. They approached him, acknowledging his sincerity, impartiality, and truthful teachings about God. They then posed a question about the permissibility of paying a poll tax to Caesar according to Jewish law and tradition. Aware of their malicious intent, Jesus asked them to show him the coin used for the poll tax. Upon seeing the denarius, he asked them whose likeness and inscription it bore. When they confirmed it was Emperor Tiberius Caesar's, Jesus responded, 
then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. This question posed a dilemma for Jesus. Advocating for tax payment could lead to accusations of challenging God's sovereignty over Israel, making him unpopular. Conversely, advocating against tax payment would make him an enemy of Rome. However, Jesus, perceiving their wickedness, demonstrated his wisdom and control with his response, rebuking the Pharisees and Herodians for their wickedness and hypocrisy. We are accountable to God in all matters, but we must also obey the government in civil and national matters. As Peter stated in 1 Peter 2 verse 17, Fear God, honor the king. Everyone bears the image of God, signifying that we belong to God, not to Caesar or even ourselves. Essentially, Jesus taught that one can be a true citizen of the kingdom of God while still obeying a foreign ruler's laws, considering them as separate entities. This implies that the kingdom of God is not of this world. As if this wasn't enough, the Sadducees attempted to trap Jesus on the same day with a question about marriage. On a particular day, some Sadducees, who denied the resurrection of the dead, approached Jesus with a question. They referred to Moses' law, which stated that if a man dies childless, his brother should marry his widow and raise children for him. They presented a scenario where seven brothers existed. The first brother married and died without leaving any children, so his wife married the second brother. This pattern continued until the woman had married all seven brothers, who all died childless. Finally, the woman herself died. The Sadducees, who were a small but influential group comprising the wealthy, aristocratic, and ruling class, posed a riddle about this woman. They asked Jesus, in the resurrection, whose wife would she be since she had been married to all seven brothers. This question was designed to embarrass Jesus, who preached the resurrection. However, Jesus responded to them in Matthew 22 verse 29, saying, You are all mistaken because you neither understand the scriptures that teach the resurrection, nor the power of God. Who is capable of raising the dead? The argument was made that the idea of resurrection was illogical due to numerous challenges, leading to the conclusion that it couldn't be true. Jesus countered by saying that the problem wasn't with the doctrine itself, but with their lack of understanding of the scriptures and God's power. It's crucial to note that the scriptures don't mention the continuation of marital relationships in heaven. While individuals will still be identifiable by their respective genders, they will all be akin to angels in the sense that they won't marry or be given in marriage. Furthermore, they were unaware of God's power. If God could create people from dust, he could certainly resurrect those who had died and transform them into glorious bodies. In Matthew 22 verses 30 to 32, it says, For in the resurrection, men neither marry nor are women given in marriage, but they are like angels in heaven who do not marry nor have children. As for the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read in the scripture what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus then used scripture to argue that resurrection is absolutely necessary. In Exodus 3 verse 6, God referred to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet, as Jesus pointed out, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. The crowds were amazed at his teaching. It's remarkable how Jesus turned these tests into learning opportunities. We should appreciate Jesus' responses as they illuminate the mysterious nature of the supernatural. We also see Jesus' wisdom when the Pharisees try to stump him with an unanswerable question. Matthew paints a fascinating picture of Jesus' adversaries trying to embarrass him, but their attempts are unsuccessful. What is the greatest commandment? Jesus wouldn't want to exclude any. He summarized the law into one principle, love God and your neighbor. He then asked a question that went unanswered, demonstrating his superior understanding of the scriptures. This is reflected in Matthew 22 verses 41 to 46, Amplified Bible. While the Pharisees were gathered, Jesus posed a question to them. He asked, what are your thoughts on the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One? Whose son is he? They responded, he is the son of David. Jesus then questioned them. How is it that David, under the inspiration of the Spirit, refers to him as Lord, saying, The Lord, the Father, told my Lord, the Son, the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could answer him, and from that day forward, no one dared to question him again. During the Passover season in Jerusalem, religious leaders tried to trap Jesus and embarrass him in front of the pilgrims. However, Jesus turned the situation around and ended up embarrassing the religious leaders. This demonstrated Jesus' wisdom. He asked a thought-provoking question during his teachings, if David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? 
The answer is that the Messiah is both David's Lord and Son, as he is both God and man. As God, he is David's Lord, and as man, he is David's Son. If the Pharisees had been open to learning, they would have understood that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of David through Mary's lineage, and the Son of God, as evidenced by his teachings, actions, and character. Solomon left us some valuable books, including the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Unparalleled Song. However, Solomon's words fall short compared to those of Jesus Christ, for they are spirit and life. Jesus' words hold more power than the wise sayings of any sage. His teachings surpass those of Solomon, as his wisdom is divine and leads people to heaven. Those who learn from him are truly blessed. In his nature, the Lord Jesus is greater than Solomon. Alas, poor Solomon, the strongest man who ever lived, Samson, was the weakest of men, and the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, was perhaps the most conspicuous fool. Our Lord is indeed different. There is no weakness in Christ, no folly in Jesus. The failings of Solomon find no counterpart in Jesus, in whom the ruler of this world found nothing, despite his thorough search. Our Lord stands above Solomon, because he is more than just an ordinary man. The disparity is vast when comparing the character's greatness between Christ and Solomon, with Christ exceeding Solomon in both essence and character. It's crucial to place our trust in him and find joy in his presence. For those of us who trust him, our love and joy in him will endure forever. May God show compassion to those who do not love him, and lead them to experience the happiness that comes from trusting in Christ. Amen.